Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn is the Bishop of Dallas, the South, in the Bulgarian Diocese. He is a monk of Simona Petra Monastery on Mount Athos, where he was the disciple of the great elder Emilianos. Uh, he is also a graduate of Oxford University, where he wrote his monumental doctoral dissertation on St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Archbishop Alexander is a wonderful archpastor, and he's, as you'll see, a uh, fine scholar. So without further ado, I hope you'll enjoy this episode from my interview with His Eminence, Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. I heard a story once about the, um, the heretic Marcion who lived in the uh, first half of the second century. And he's a heretic because he, among other things, he said, we don't need the, New Te the Old Testament. That's Jewish stuff. And the God of the Old Testament can't be our God because he's a mean character and threatens and bullies and kills and can therefore have nothing to do with the loving Father of the Lord Jesus. In fact, it's to Marcion that we owe the first Christian canon of Scripture. He throws out the Old Testament and he throws out almost all of what we call the New Testament too. He keeps a selected collection of St. Paul's letters and an edited version of the Gospel of Luke. And the story I heard about him was that the Apostle John once found himself in the same bath, like Roman baths, steam baths, as Marcion and immediately left cursing the place and declaring the walls would fall on him before he'd sit, on, he'd sit in the same room with Marcion. And I heartily concur with the Apostle's view and do so because there is no Christianity without what we call the Old Testament. Or rather, the Old Testament is part of the same revelation of which the Lord Jesus is the continuation and completion. To use a, a Greek word, the Lord Jesus is the telos of the law. He's the completion, the end goal, even the meaning of the revelation of the law to Moses and to the prophets. Everything the Lord Jesus preaches, for example, the, fame, the gospel that we read on Meat Fair Sunday, whose refrain is, for as much as you have done this to the least of my brethren, you have done it or not done it to me. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, comforting the bereaved, and so on. And this preaching is a summary of the preaching of the, God, of the, of the prophets so far as social relations go, and indeed, of the teaching of the law. If you were to look at both law and prophets, to compare the Scripture and New Testament, to compare the Scripture with our modern, with our contemporary concerns, especially the concerns contemporary to the um, Christian spokesman in the United States, you would find 
precious little about sexual relations or sexual identity, next to none about that, and precious little about sexual relations. What you would find tons and tons of in law, prophets, and gospels is concern for the poor, for the outcast, for the stranger, for the needy, for the helpless. Now that's primarily, not that I like the word very much, but that's primarily mm, ethical, moral, social, but it's also our foundation as Christians. And the foundation that the Lord Jesus deliberately draws on. Perhaps more to the point for those especially of uh, Orthodox Christian persuasion, there is a matter of worship. We're sitting right now in an Orthodox Church that is constructed very much on the traditional pattern. It has a big middle that we call the nave. It has an area closed off at the east end, closed off by the iconostas, called the sanctuary. And the second area closed off at the west end called the porch or narthex. Well, this is a plan that we inherit from the revelation to Israel. Specifically, the book of Exodus and the latter part of the book of Exodus, which if you've ever tried to read the Bible from end to end, perhaps when you were a freshman like me in college, you probably did swimmingly as you went through Genesis and <clears throat> the first part of Exodus. And then you hit a wall where the text dissolved from stories, adventures even, into details about colors of yarn and types of wood and lots and lots of cubits quite deadly stuff. The paradox is, though, that it's exactly those chapters, from Exodus 25 on, that riveted the attention of both the ancient rabbis whose, com whose comments and arguments comprise the Jewish Talmud and the ancient fathers of the church. Gregory of Nyssa, the famous Cappadocian, for example, writes a life of Moses in the late fourth century and to which he devotes fully half, half to those very chapters. And why is that? Because they're the revelation of worship. God says to Moses in Exodus 25, 9, you will build me a sanctuary that I may dwell with my people, and you will build it according to the, exactly according to the pattern that I show you in all its details. Now the question is, one question certainly, which preoccupied people as early as at least two centuries before Christ, is what is meant by the word pattern? What did God show Moses? Now, our uh, modern reaction, I think, would be to think of a blueprint. He gives him the blueprint for the tabernacle that follows in, in numbing detail. But, it's, as is clear from, say, uh, the writings that uh, begin to come out around 200 BC, plus or minus a little, like uh, the Book of Enoch, the first part of the Book of Enoch, uh, like 
the materials we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls that date from the period between 200 BC and, um, and the birth of Christ. The Book of Jubilees, or the Longer Exit, uh, Genesis, as it's called. There appears to have been a consensus that what God showed Moses was a heavenly temple or tabernacle, which Moses is ordered to copy on earth, so that everything, all the worship will be on earth as it is in heaven. And by the way, that's a phrase from the Lord's Prayer, um, not just then to do with the divine will, but with the proper worship. For Orthodox Christians, I think I can illustrate the point by noting that the Greek word orthodoxy, orthodoxia, has two meanings. It can mean right opinion, or I guess doctrine would say, right belief, or it can mean right glory right worship. And it's interesting that when Cyril and Methodius or the disciples came to translate this word into Slavic, they chose the second. Pravoslavia, they translated orthodoxia with, right glorification, right worship. So they understood that as fundamental. And the pattern for it is laid down in those chapters in Exodus. Just as is the idea of the worship of heaven replicated, imaged forth on earth. That is an idea from the Old Testament that we have fully embodied in our own worship. Think of the hymn of the cherubim which says we are images, worshiping here in the church, of the cherubim who support the throne of God in the heavenly liturgy. Hi again, hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with His Eminence Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Please leave a comment below, let me know what you thought of this video. And please subscribe below uh, so you can get notified the next time an episode becomes available, which happens every Friday. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week.